Good evening, everyone. Welcome to you all. Welcome to the Observatorio of the Instituto Cervantes at Harvard University and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Probably you know that the mission of the Observatorio uh, is to observe, to analyze, to debate on the Spanish language and Hispanic cultures in the United States. So in order to accomplish uh, this mission, the Observatorio organizes and hosts uh, activities, academic activities like this, regarding the current situation of the Spanish language in the United States, their minorities, the teaching of foreign languages, especially Spanish, and the culture and thought in Spanish. The Observatorio observes and then explains what it observed. So to this goal, we published the journal Informes del Observatorio, Observatorio Reports, which is a free online bilingual and monthly uh, publication journal. You may find it on the website of the Observatorio. And we have some copies in over the decks, so you might pick up uh, freely. And nevertheless, the Observatorio has published a special uh, printed edition uh, of the last report, because not by chance, it is a report by Carmen Silva Corbalan, and its title is Spanish Acquisition uh, in third, by Third Generation Children. So when you get out, you may pick up your copy. This event today is a conversation. It's a conversation in the Observatorio about the Spanish acquisition by third generation children with a presentation by Professor Carmen Silva Corbalan. Carmen Silva Corbalan is uh, an expert in sociolinguistics of Spanish through time and space, including US dialects. And she is professor of Spanish in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese in the University of Southern California. She has shown an excellent expertise in Spanish in the USA, of course, social and geographic varieties of Spanish, linguistic uh, aspects of bilingualism, Spanish linguistics, sociolinguistics, Latin America dialectology. She is author of uh, Sociolinguistica Teoria y Analysis, 1989, Language Contact in Change and Change, uh, Spanish in Los Angeles, 1996, Sociolinguistica y Pragmática del Español, 2004, or Bilingual Language Acquisition, 2014. She's also editor of Spanish in Four Continents, 1995, and co-editor of, of uh, Studies in Romance Linguistics, uh, 1986, and Bilinguismo y Adquisición del Español, 1992. So I want to thank Professor Carmen Silva Corbalan for being here today with us. And I want to express my gratitude, my deeper gratitude to two observatorio very good friends. They are Professor Daniel Erker from uh, Boston University and Professor Maria Luisa Parra from Harvard University. Daniel Erker is assistant professor of Spanish and linguistics in Boston University. His research interests include language variation, contact and change, acoustic and articulatory phonetics, Spanish in the United States, the languages of Latin America, and the evolution of human language. Professor Erker is currently developing uh, the Spanish in Boston research project, a community-based study which examines how Spanish is spoken in the greater Boston area. And Maria Luisa Parra is senior preceptor at the Department of Romance and uh, Languages and Literatures in Harvard University. Her main areas of expertise are Spanish as foreign languages, as foreign language, Spanish as uh, heritage language, families and immigration. She's uh, pioneering the first course of, for Latino students uh, at Harvard University and her work with immigrant families focuses on new strategies to assist parents and teachers in supporting uh, child's school adaptation, bilingualism, and academic success. So thank you both for uh, sharing with us your uh, time in these very complicated weeks. And thank you all for coming to the coming up to this uh, observatory of facilities. And now join me, please, to, to welcome Carmen Silva Corbalan. Thank you. Thank you. Point, uh, I, I'm very short, so I don't know whether I should stand or sit. I think I'm going to sit. Um, you see me from the back. You, if, if you can hear me, then that's good enough. Um, well, before starting, I'd like to thank Professor Francisco 
Moreno Fernandez for having invited me to come here to the observatorio. Uh, I'm very honored by your invitation and very happy to be able to share the little I know about uh, child bilingualism with two outstanding colleagues, Maria Luisa, thank you for being here, and Danny Eckert. Thank you all for being here despite the rain. Um, I know it's not easy to walk in the rain. It was easy for some actor in walking in the rain or something like that, <laughs> but not in real life. Um, okay, so I was asked some time ago uh, to talk about uh, the acquisition of Spanish by third generation children because my own grandchildren are third generation. We started about, I'd say 30 years ago, um, talking about Spanish across generations rather than just saying these are the characteristics of Spanish in the United States. You know, they borrow words or they change the syntax of Spanish. Uh, they mix uh, Spanish and English. And then we realized that uh, we couldn't say the same thing about everyone in this country. There is a whole continuum of proficiencies in Spanish uh, and in English in uh, Hispanic communities. So the studies of Spanish that are being done nowadays are done by categorizing speakers either by country, um, you know, Spanish from uh, speakers from Mexico or from uh, Puerto Rico or Cuba, Republican, uh, Dominican Republic and so on and so forth, or by categorizing them by generation because it's easier than categorizing them by competence in Spanish. And so we speak of first generation immigrants. That would be me, for instance. I came from Chile uh, 45 years ago, and I'm first generation immigrant in this country. My children then would be second generation immigrants. Right? Even though they were not born here, the youngest one at least came before the age of eight. So he did all of his elementary schooling in English, so second generation. And then his children, and Maria Luisa has brought my book, these are my grandchildren, <laughs> would be third generation. Now, as uh, Professor Moreno has said, these are going to be conversations, and I hope that the conversation will be also with all of you, that you will ask us questions and will interact with us. That's my hope, okay? Um, let me see if I can. Oh, what I wanted to point out then is that even though we speak of first generation, second generation, third generation, there are no clear cut linguistic differences between these groups. You can find someone, first generation, who is fully bilingual in Spanish and English others who are not fully bilingual in both languages, um, but only minimally bilingual with uh, weak English, strong Spanish. Second generation, the same situation. In Los Angeles, which is where I've done most of my, I mean, all of my studies of bilingualism, I have not come across any second generation person who doesn't know English as well. So, English is the language that second generation children use among them and uh, in school, in the playground, everywhere. Now, do they also know Spanish? It depends. There are a number of factors, and I think that I've pointed some out here. Uh, this is the definition that we give of generations. And as you can see, it says the trend, there is a trend across generations for a gradual preference for using English, right, with family and friends. But as I say, you can find even third generation children sometimes using Spanish with their grandparents. So uh, it's only a, a trend. However, 
68% of third generation Cubans and 71% of third generation Mexicans speak only English, so they've become monolingual. Now, one of my main messages today, I hope, will be that third generation children do not necessarily have to be monolingual in English. Uh, it takes, uh, of course, some effort, and the children have to be motivated to learn Spanish, uh, but as in the case of my grandchildren, there are many third generation children who acquire Spanish and are bilingual in English and Spanish. Okay. So that those are the exceptions. You find the majority of the exceptions to the rule of shift from Spanish to, yes, from Spanish to English is found along the border border states, uh, California, New Mexico, Texas. Um, there are towns where you can find uh, third, fourth, fifth generation uh, children who are bilingual in English and Spanish. Also in cities away from the border, Dallas for instance in Texas or Los Angeles in California, there are some areas with 90% Hispanics, right? Uh, Spanish is the language you hear in the streets, in the stores, uh, uh, you go to church in Spanish. Schools are fighting to keep some form of bilingual education and children then from third, fourth, fifth generation <coughs> may still be bilingual, so they still know Spanish. Grandparents, of course, play an important role, so I feel very important as a grandparent. Uh, and uh, uh, if grandparents insist, uh, well, you, t you speak Spanish with me, then those children are going to end up speaking Spanish. Of course, if the grandparents are nice and play with them. That's right. Okay, so as, as I said, I mean, it depends on a number of contextual factors, like the age at which uh, the child is exposed to the two languages, that's very important. The younger the child is exposed to English, the more than English will take over the functions of Spanish. Right? And, uh, and then Spanish starts becoming functionally reduced. So the less uh, exposure to Spanish, the easier it is for the children not to develop full proficiency in this language. Uh, I already spoke of number of speakers I mean, in communities that are heavily Hispanic. It's easier to keep the language. <clears throat> the frequency attitudes are so very important. Attitudes are incredibly important. If the attitude within the family is a positive attitude towards bilingualism, if the children see that their elders speak both languages, they will want also to be able to speak two languages like their elders, their parents or grandparents. Um, community and political attitudes are crucial. Why? Because if the school is not supporting bilingualism, then it becomes more difficult for children to maintain a level of good proficiency in the minority language. So even my grandchildren, for instance, would not be bilingual today, I don't think, if they had not attended a, um, a dual language uh, school. Some people call them a two-way bilingual school, dual language school, bilingual school. So they went to uh, an immersion school <laughs> in Spanish. Um, if it were immersion, it would be totally in Spanish, but in fact it was dual language, Spanish and English. They wouldn't, have, they wouldn't be bilingual today. I mean, these little kids are now, of course, in college. Uh, and um, as I say, they wouldn't be bilingual. Why? Because they stop speaking with the grandparents. Right? They, they no longer play with the grandmother. So they would receive less and less input in the minority language if they were not receiving input in a school. So the formal learning of the language is very important if we want third or fourth generation children 
to learn or develop proficiency in the minority language. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how long you want me to speak. You tell me the five or ten more minutes. Yeah. yeah. So um, we have spoken in, in studies of bilingual acquisition of two major what we call patterns in bilingual language acquisition. We call one simultaneous bilingual acquisition, and that is when the child is exposed to two languages from birth, or at least before age three. Usually that happens when the parents speak two languages, so that they come to an agreement and they say, okay, I'll speak to the child in English and you speak to the child in Spanish, or we speak uh, English Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Spanish Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or we speak uh, only Spanish in the home and English as soon as we step out of the home. So separating the context very clearly then uh, apparently helps the child figure out the two systems and keep them relatively apart. That would be simultaneous bilingualism. There's, there are also, of course, and that's probably the majority in uh, communities like the ones we find in Los Angeles, what we call sequential bilingualism. These are children who have been exposed to Spanish at home, but by age four or five, they start preschool, kindergarten, it's all in English. Uh, and they start learning English and become bilingual. So, so that would be sequential bilingualism. And there are consequences. Uh, sometimes those children may refuse or not be too very motivated to learn the majority language and they may have problems in school. Uh, or sometimes the opposite will happen. They'll focus only in, uh, uh, on English and stop using Spanish. That almost happened to my second grandson. At age four, three and a half, he stopped using Spanish. He didn't want to speak Spanish anymore. Uh, my daughter-in-law told me that uh, when they said we're going to grandma's house, he uh, resisted going. And why now? Because she talks to me in Spanish. And um, there was a degree of resistance to Spanish. But uh, with good attitudes around the home and encouragement, fortunately, and also because he was told that he would be going to a bilingual school where Spanish was going to be as important as English, then he started speaking Spanish again. But he spent about six months around age three and a half, four, not wanting to speak Spanish. That didn't happen to the older child. He was always, and, and uh, understandably so, that's also a very typical pattern in families. The oldest child uh, develops uh, the minority language very well, and the second one not so well. The third one sometimes doesn't learn it at all because productively, he may have receptive, or he or she may have receptive knowledge of Spanish, but won't have productive uh, knowledge of Spanish. Why? I mean, the, the third one is already playing not with the grandparents or the mother or the father, who is the one who speaks to them in, in the minority language, but with the older siblings. The older siblings already go to school, they know English, they all play in English. So the less input, the less they uh, develop uh, proficiency in the minority language. So that is crucial. I mean, study after study has demonstrated that the minimum input that a child must receive in a minority language is 30, well, I'd say around 30% of the time, so that uh, we make calculations. In fact, uh, uh, these are my grandchildren. They grew up in a dual language home. See, so there you have, we, we calculate the hours that the child spends uh, in contact with uh, 
each language. And of course, the calculation is a sort of a global calculation. How many hours uh, during the week does the child spend with the mother, with the parent who speaks one language or the other? Uh, has the child been read in one of the languages, seen movies in one of the languages? And overall, um, many studies done both in Europe, Canada, and here uh, have shown that that child who has received about 30% uh, input in the minority language will get to develop good proficiency, let's call it that way, I mean, in, in a loose way, in this minority language. Um, less than that, then you start seeing a little bit of difficulties to communicate in, in the minority language. Um, from the age of four, my two grandchildren, for instance, were not getting not even getting 30%, 20 to 25% of the time, of their time was spent with Spanish. This is why I say that as the children grow up and they have less contact with the uh, parents or grandparents and more contact with other children, then English becomes stronger, stronger and stronger, and they might even lose their Spanish proficiency. I mean, not lose it, but at least lose productive proficiency. Well, we, we, one of the things that uh, was important in our family is that we never laughed at the children. If they made any mistakes, and I've seen this during my uh, research in Los Angeles, uh, I've seen that parents or grandparents either laugh because the children are making mistakes in Spanish when they try to use Spanish, or correct them too frequently or criticize them. Oh, th this is one example when Nico, for instance, says, estoy empado. And, uh, uh, and his father says, enfadado. You know, he corrects without saying, oh, empado is wrong or don't say that. No, enfadado he just produces the correct form. And expands, es igual que enojado. And the child repeats, oh, estoy enfadado un poquito. That is a strategy that this child, who is a very good language learner, better than his brother, uh, used very frequently, repetition. He always repeated what uh, the adults said. Anyway. So with respect to how they developed, well, uh, maybe they want to he hear this, uh, uh, this one. This is just a sample of how the bilingual child has to be so cognitively alert at all times, because he's, th this child is hearing two languages coming from different people, and he or she has to respond in the appropriate language or has to be able to understand the languages coming up from different people. So here we have M is Nico at two years, seven months, and 27 days. M is his mother, F the father, C, that's me. They call me Bibi, I wrote there because this is Bibi at some point. And um, I, I don't know how this, the, oh, there it is, there it is. So, yeah. They're on the floor, says the letter. That's me now. That's okay. Anyway, so just a sample of the very typical bilingual type situation which these children need to face. Uh, I have done studies of uh, linguistic. Uh, factors. Uh, the, the last thing I'm going to say is that uh, one of the uh, reasons that I find bilingualism so useful for children is that they become aware at a very early age uh, of the independence between word and object. Right? They, they, they develop 
metalinguistic skills say, at a very early age. They, they, they really create metaphors because sometimes they don't have a word, so they have to go roundabout to explain what they want to say. Um, they have uh, phonological awareness. They're aware of sounds and how different the two languages sound. And these are all skills that are going to be very useful to them when they start school, when they start learning how to read and write. Uh, um, the, the awareness of the units of language, you know, words, languages have words, uh, and they're different, and the same word may refer to different uh, things, and also different words may refer to the same thing. Very important uh, um, metalinguistic skills. Well, I mean, there's so much to say, and I know that uh, my colleagues want to ask questions, and you want to ask questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so we should, uh, I should, shut up. <laughs> I should be quiet now for a moment and see whether you have any questions, any comments. Thank you, Carmen. First yeah. of all, I wanna, when I was, when I knew that you were coming, I was yeah. so excited because we, we met, um, we saw each other recently at UCLA where you were presenting your, your book. And being a mother of two bilingual teenagers now, um, I, and working with parents that are raising children, bilingual children, I find your work fascinating. And I just wanted to congratulate you, you and you. commend you for I was, I wrote your work, but then I thought, no, it's not work, it's monumental work. <laughs> because you have to have worked with children, uh, like um, speaking and analyzing data, naturalistic mm -hmm. data, data from children or adults to know what is in this book. And we were talking about it yeah. this, this <laughs> afternoon when we were having yeah. lunch, the hours, months, and years, mm -hmm. and we can talk a little bit about it, that um, are in, in this book, and the care, uh, mm -hmm. because you have your, your work grandchildren here, I identify with it, I'm, because my mother also is very involved in my voice development, linguistic development. So I really want to thank you, because for many of us who are interested in this new you know, era of uh, globalization and multilingualism, this book is very valuable no, thank to you. understand you know, how our children are growing up um, with these different linguistic systems around them. Um, you didn't talk too much about the content of the book, but I just want to give the audience a brief overview of, of the things that you analyzed just in chapter three. Uh, you're going to get some of those in um, the report, but in chapter three, she gives an overview of the development of her grandchildren, and she talks about um, the development from one word to two words, um, expressing negation, which is one of my favorite topics in linguistics, <laughs> asking questions in English and Spanish, um, the separate development of both languages, which I found fascinating yeah. in terms of the theory. We can maybe talk a little bit more about it. The cross-linguistic interaction in areas like the verb gustar, which is, we all know that it's, you know, a specific um, feature of our language that it's hard, especially for English speakers, clitics, uh, stranded prepositions, possessive constructions, complements of querer, lexical innovations, metalinguistic awareness, mixing and switching, and going from sentence to discourse. Um, so those are just some of the parts that you have in chapter three. Mm -hmm. So the rest of, just to give you an example of the richness and the detail the work that you have done um, in this. So I don't know if you would like to um, comment on what was involved, the methodology that you use, um, what kind of principles guided you when you were starting to record, choosing what to record, what to transcribe, um, that you thought that could be you know, um, part of this work. Well, the, the motivation came from my study of adults first because one of the questions that is usually asked in the field is whether um, bilingual adults who 
So uh, um, I, I don't like to use the word reduce, but show different features. There's the Spanish or bilingual adults, second generation, is characterized by features that are different from those of the first generation immigrants. The question is, have they acquired Spanish to a certain level and then forgotten what they knew? Or is it that they never really learned all these features before English became their dominant language? So you know, is it uh, incomplete acquisition, as they say, or attrition? And of course, as I said, well, we need to know how much English and Spanish bilingual children know by the time they start schooling. And uh, I was lucky to have grandchildren, so I, <laughs> I started uh, recording them from the very first word they produced. Um, the methodology is you carry with you a little notebook and at first write down everything the child says uh, phonetically and then you try to interpret what it was that the child meant because the child may say something like ta 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 and what does ta 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 mean? Is he referring to the ta ta, the clock? Because we've talked about the tick tac tick tac, you know, is ta ta the clock or ta ta their grandfather? whom they may call Tata as well. What? So the context needs to be um, observed carefully so that you can interpret what the child may have meant in that situation. That's the very beginning. Um, once the children produce more language, then you may start recording them. Now, I did not have a video camera, which some researchers do have. I, uh, I just used a very good quality tape recorder and carried my little notebook with me, wrote down it, the day, the time, the place, who was present. Or in the recording itself, I would say, we are at such and such a place and um, present are so and so, and we're just playing or so you, you need to, th th this is really a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest of the family gets very upset because you are <laughs> observing them and recording them. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they finally come to understand uh, and, and collaborate, forget about the tape recorder. So that's how you do it. I mean, they, um, the, the questions, as I say, that are being asked is, do children undergo a stage of mixed systems? I mean, is it the case that when bilingual children are exposed to two languages from birth, they learned a mixed language? And uh, you want to say something no, about I'm that? No, I'm enjoying what you're saying. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so a, a mixed language. So. Uh, during the 70s and 80s, then uh, linguists were saying that yes, that children go through a stage of uh, uh, speaking a language that's a mixed system of two different languages. But later on, other researchers have shown that in fact, what the children do is just mix words. So they may say, uh, uh, open puerta, or give me pelota. Uh, these are words. They're not important. Words are being created in languages every day, every minute. So it doesn't matter. What matters is, are they producing sounds that belong to the two different languages? Are they differentiating the phonological systems? Are they differentiating the syntactic systems? So in English, for instance, children must produce subjects. They have to say, uh, I open the door. They cannot say, open the door. No, it's I open the door. Right? In Spanish, we don't need to say yo. Right? So subjects are not necessary. 
Now, so what we started finding out was that children mix words. Why do they mix words? Because most of the time they don't know the word in the other language, so they use the word they know. Right? So there is a period of time during which there is some mixing of words, but not of systems, right? not, the, not the syntax or the phonology. One of my students, as a matter of fact, did a fantastic study in collaboration with a phonologist from the linguistics department and showed very clearly that the phonologists were, were independent, that uh, the features that the child produced when she studied one of my granddaughters who was trilingual, she was learning three languages, Tagalog, Spanish, and English. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the phonological features were different when she spoke to the mother in Tagalog or to the father in Spanish or to her, her sister in English. And the syntax was also different. Tagalog, for instance, prefers the order verb first and then other constituents like noun phrases and things after the verb. And she was producing that word order much more frequently in Tagalog than in English or Spanish. In, uh, in the case of my grandchildren, subjects, from the very beginning, they produced um, more subjects in English than in Spanish. Now, all children, monolingual children, speakers of English, don't produce pronouns at first. I mean, they, they don't. It's, uh, uh, there's controversy about why it is that they do not produce pronouns. Danny, you know those, right? Uh, so it's not surprising that at first they do not produce pronouns. This is not influenced from Spanish because monolinguals don't produce them either. Right? Uh, so as soon as they realize that, uh, or they, you know, they are a little older and they can now hear the pronouns and produce the pronouns, then they start using them in English with. Um, 80%, 90% of the time, 98% of the time, while in Spanish, it's the opposite. There are fewer and fewer pronouns, uh, or 40, 50% of pronouns. So they do differentiate the systems very clearly, and in my studies of Spanish in Los Angeles, I have found that uh, um, there is very little influence, syntactic influence, grammatical influence of English, on Spanish. There's a lot of influence at the lexical level. You see them here. You know, even children, it says, Bibi, combete con tu cepillo. Right? Combete, from to comb, combete. But that shows, that I, I call that morphological mixing. It shows that at that early age, two years and seven months, that child knows the verb system of Spanish. Right? Here's morphologically Spanish with a lexical item from English. So they separate the, uh, the languages very clearly. He doesn't say, Bibi, come con tu cepillo. No, combete, huh? peinate. He uses really Spanish grammar, the Spanish system. So that, uh, that's uh, one of the, uh, of the questions. I say one, acquisition versus attrition. Uh, are the systems independent? Yes, they are, but there is, of course, a level of cross-linguistic influence. And in the case of uh, Spanish, it's usually in the direction of English influencing Spanish rather than the opposite, because English is the majority language. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> sure, um, so I, I should preface question I have for you uh, with the following. Uh, when, when Paco wrote to me and said, Danny, would you like to be uh, part of this conversation uh, about bilingual acquisition among children? My first thought was, that sounds great, except I don't know anything about uh, bilingual acquisition in children. Um, and then he said, but Carmen Silva Corral will be there. And I said, sign me up. <laughs> so um, it's a pleasure to, to, to meet you in person um, and be on this, this uh small panel with you as well, Maria Luisa. Um, so I, I spend most of my time uh, looking at folks who have already gone through the acquisition process. That is uh, bilingual uh, adults, 
Um, oftentimes, I am interested in comparing um, recent arrivals from Latin America who speak Spanish to individuals who are born in the United States and who are who are bilingual, and comparing the linguistic behavior of these individuals and and looking at ways in which contact between the two linguistic systems may produce different varieties of linguistic behavior, and whether that's at the phonological level, the sound level, the morphological level, the, the grammatical units level, or the syntactic level, the way constituents are, are organized. Um, I usually look at this from a, uh, a variationist perspective. So I count uh, lots of things and then see if people are statistically significantly different from each other. Um, one of my dissertation advisors told me that I'm so into counting things that I should see if I could get a sponsorship from Goya, because I count so many beans. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I've not yet landed that sponsorship. But um, my, my question is, uh, well, let me just say a, a little bit more, and then and I, I can offer you this question. Uh, one of the things that we uh, know uh, that is that ac across generations, we find not only the influence of English on uh, linguistic systems, uh, but also uh, we see patterns of so-called dialect leveling in certain right. cases. So differences between uh, varieties of Spanish that are brought by first generations from parts of Mexico, parts of Chile, parts of the Dominican Republic, wherever, um, that certain differences start to evaporate over time. And one of the things that we observe is that country of origin of a Spanish speaker in the United States is still very socially salient but it's less and less predictive of linguistic behavior. That is, the way somebody produces their syllable final s is highly constrained by their region of origin if they're a first generation immigrant. Less so if they're third or fourth or fifth. And so my, my question is, what, what, is your, what is your assessment or your take on the role of country of origin as a, an identity category for third generation and beyond Spanish speakers here in the US? Can I be a politician and avoid answering that question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because because you know, I, w with respect to country of origin, you know, I, I'm very limited because I've focused only on Mexicans and Mexican Americans and, uh, and now Chileans because this is Chilean. So I haven't looked at uh, um, bilingual phenomena from the perspective of country of origin, but but I do uh, I sort of agree with uh, something you said, which is you you have here two languages, right? And and it is possible, and it has been shown, as we all know, that um, let's say in Spanish we have a certain pronunciation of b, d, g, p, t, k in initial position, right? And in English, that's different. There's, there is this p with aspiration, like in a, this pen, pen, whereas we would say pen, right? It almost sounds like ben. Um, peso, beso sounds almost the same to Anglo ears. And what they have found out is that, uh, that bilinguals then have intermediate measurements of these two different sounds. Uh, so th there is some change. And in the sense, I mean, I, I have said before that children do not learn a mixed system. And now I'm, to a certain extent, contradicting myself because I'm saying, but you know, after decades, then systems may become somewhat uh, convergent. <clears throat> and uh, not, not systems, but Spanish may converge a little bit in the direction of English, let's put it that way. I, may I add to yeah. that briefly? Yeah. So um, I think this issue of contact-induced structural convergence is, I think of it, the, the data are fairly clear, and it suggests that indeed uh, structural convergence is evident uh, among bilinguals. But to, to your point, um, what, we, yeah. what we tend not to find is the wholesale introduction of a new structural feature, say from English into Spanish. Um, but with respect to contact between those two languages, what we tend to find 
is modulation towards English in parts of the grammar of Spanish that are already variable. So Spanish has variable use of overt subject pronouns, saying yo digo or simply digo. English, by comparison, mostly requires these subjects. So in context situations, we tend to find more pronouns. Does that mean that we have radical convergence between Spanish and English? Not really. What we have is a variable feature, namely the presence or absence of a pronoun, that in a context situation, one option is exercised with greater frequency. So you tend to find these kinds of structural convergences between these two linguistic systems, and in fact, cross-linguistically in context situations, in the variable aspects of the grammar. That's right. I completely agree. In 1994, when I did the study of adults in, uh, I don't know, I'll talk about this, that's why it's right there. <coughs> in Los Angeles, you know, I showed that uh, I did not find uh, really new syntactic structures. And the children themselves, for instance, may use, as Maria Luisa pointed out, uh, you know, what we call stranded prepositions. When the preposition goes at the end and they say, um, who did you go there with, right? Who did you go there with? That's normal in, in English. That's, everybody uses that type of construction with the preposition at the end. That doesn't exist in Spanish. If we incorporated that type of construction in Spanish, that would be a case of structural influence, which we do not have in stable varieties of Spanish. Yet we find that, that type of construction in Spanish in small children. So they will say things like, uh, ¿Qué es esto para? Hmm? ¿Qué es esto para? Uh, ¿Qué abro esto con? No? Quiero say yes. Uh, so they do tend to put the preposition at the end. Now, that is a type of uh, influence from English that violates what I call typological features of Spanish or the core grammar of Spanish. And language contact does not accept that. So what happens is that beyond the age of four and a half, the children have stopped using these prepositions at the end of sentences. They have stopped using the English genitive because at first they can say, and you told me that your children also used to say it, things like, uh, vamos a, a la grandma's casa? A la abuela's casa? Eso es. Eh, fuimos a Nico's escuela. <laughs> so they say those things in transition. It, it's the same as when monolingual children say, uh, he go to the park, instead of he went to the park. They're sort of testing the grounds in a way. Um, but when, when the, uh, the constructions really violate the, the structure of Spanish, they're discarded later on. Later on. Now, as uh, Danny has just said, Variable features is different. Why is it that we have expression or not expression of subjects in Spanish? We still don't know. You know, we can count, we can count and count and count, and there are many cases that we can justify and say, ah, it's expressed for this particular reason. I mean, either because we're being contrastive, yo fui al cine y él se fue a la playa. We couldn't say, yo fui al cine y se fue a la playa. No, estamos hablando de Pepe, yo y Pepe. ¿Y qué, hicieron, ¿Qué hiciste tú y Pepe? ¿Qué hicieron ustedes ayer? Ah, yo fui al cine y se fue a la playa. No, tengo que decir, y él se fue a la playa. O sea, hay ciertos, ciertos contextos sintácticos donde tenemos que expresar el sujeto y podemos explicar por qué está ahí. Pero hay muchos donde no podemos explicar nada. Entonces, hay... Ciertas, ciertos factores de tipo discursivo pragmático. Why am I speaking in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. I'm I knew sorry. you didn't notice either. That was the best part. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All of a I said, I'm speaking in Spanish. <laughs> you know, it's Pepe's I'm, so I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, Oh my goodness. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, what's the gloss for that, actually? That's right. <laughs> anyway, so uh, 
You don't need me to repeat that, right? <laughs> no. Uh, anyway, but uh, the, 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 you know, I, I call that uh, a case of uh, quantitative influence from English. It's quantitative. And because in English you have 99% of subjects expressed, say, 99% of subjects in before the verb, then that pushes Spanish a little bit in that direction. Mm -hmm. and the, yes. Oh, yes. sorry. No, I'm sorry. Certainly. Well, because those are factors that are going to make a difference in mm -hmm. what you're finding. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a lot of different kinds of uh, you know, immigrant uh, parents and teachers and so forth. And I'm a first generation immigrant in a few different countries too. And English was not my first language. And I really believe in what you're doing and what you're saying. And there's one dilemma that everybody has. Now, depending on the lexical, you know, the, the features of a language, does it make a difference? Because, and also, what kind of writing are you getting? He's very great. Teachers are very good. Um, the writing and phonological awareness, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, twice a week, let's say, in Russian. Right. And then he speaks only Spanish with me on Skype and only Spanish. Yes. So I say, oh, so you, you sound more fluid in Spanish now. And he goes, yes, but they're all English, so I'm learning more English. And he does the transference of the grammatical structure of Russian a lot more. He's dominant Russian. Right. So he will do the, the subject at the end and the all pronouns and the structure. So how much guidance do I give him as a mother and a teacher? Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. It seems to me that uh, yeah, my, my uh, method was always to play with them. Just read stories to them. Um, we played a lot about uh, telling dreams. Uh, so I made up dreams. Not that I had dreamt really anything. Uh, <laughs> So, oh, you know, last night I dreamt that this and this, and then it came, and I said, have you had any dreams? And then, so it's just playful. It has to be playful with children. You cannot just, you can't sit them down and teach them anything. Uh, but you need to expose them to the languages. They need, I'd say, with less than 25% uh, of their time exposed to a language, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be very difficult, very difficult. Well, yeah. Right, I, I, I did say that also. I understand you, but I prefer for you to speak to me in Spanish. Because uh, see, he, they're surrounded by English. Right. The English they're going to learn easily. So it's the minority language is the ones that need the support. I would like to take this you know, intervention also and what you were saying about context to ask you about this age, three and four. I was really intrigued because you repeat that. It was between three and four where they start showing some resistance, yes. when there were some changes, uh, where the, when English started to become more dominant. And I was thinking in terms of their cognition, what kind of cognitive development they're going through. 
And it's very demanding. It's a time where they become more aware of abstractions, exactly. um, symbolic play, and sometimes the entrance to kindergarten or some kind of preschool. So that, I don't know if you have any ideas, but it seems like it's a very like, turning point age, three, four, where bilingual development can follow and really turn into a more monolingual uh, performance. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. It's uh, the age of three, three and a half is viewed as one of the milestones in mm -hmm. language development, cognitive development. And uh, so children start speaking more at that age, and uh, uh, parents want to, sorry, even the parent who speaks the minority language uh, will feel a little frustrated because the child will come home from daycare or preschool or kindergarten, not kindergarten yet at no, that no, age, no, no. no it's, it's a daycare preschool, mm -hmm. yes, preschool, and will want to tell or talk about his experiences in the language in which he lived those experiences. That's also, you know, they call it the complementary principle in, in bilingualism. Uh, you, you, you live uh, an experience in language A, you want to talk about that experience in that language. And so the parent then doesn't want to stop the child from talking to them in that language A, <laughs> And it's like a vicious circle. So every day, every day, there's less input right. in the minority language mm -hmm. at the home um, because of what you just pointed out. The child is developing cognitively and linguistically and finds it easier than to communicate in the majority language, in the language in which he is having daily experiences. Yeah. yeah. It seems like it's yeah. a jump two word to discourse, right. right? And how to connect discourse, the discourse connectors, cultural yeah. relationships, and how to have access to that in the minority language seems That's like right. a challenge for yeah, parents it is. And, and children. Yep. Have you had anything? Hi, so Hi. Um, I'm curious about the impact of uh, older students, like young students, The, uh, I, I think that the influence of the older siblings is enormous, enormous. And children will stop talking with the parents <laughs> and will prefer to play and talk with their older sibling. And if the older sibling is speaking in English, then the cause is almost lost. Um, I tended, I, it was easier for me than because I was determined that the second one would also speak Spanish. So I played with him a lot, and I had my husband go with the older one and take him away or, you know, so, so that I could spend really good quality time. Because it's, it, it, that's the key. It's You're a good time. grandma. I am. <laughs> But even despite all the efforts, it takes a lot of effort for the second and the third child that was completely lost. I mean, if. Would you recommend to break that up and break apart that? No, no, I'd say if, if one of you could take the older one away <laughs> for. for, <laughs> for no, for a little while, a little while every day. I mean, you cannot you cannot stop them from playing with each other. They're going to do that, and they're going to play in English. That's, uh, uh, my recommendation is send them to a bilingual school. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, because they. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Yeah, 
I uh, avoided uh, all my, uh, I always avoided to, to assume the role of a teacher or, or correcting them too much. Uh, I let them mix the languages if they wanted to, as long as it's lexical mixture. I mean, even the, you, you have their examples, I mean, uh, word combinations that they use, like, uh, oh, no puedo esperar a las vacaciones. We don't say that in Spanish. You know, if, if we say no puedo esperar, it's the literal meaning. No puedo esperar a Paco, ya es demasiado tarde. I can't wait for Paco. It, it has a literal meaning in Spanish, not in English. In English, it's a, a, an idiomatic expression. I can't wait for classes to be over. I can't wait for this lecture to be over. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and they, so what happens is that they, uh, they just uh, translate uh, constructions. Uh, all these uh, uh, lexical complexes get to be uh, uh, taken literally from, I mean, the, the, the words are Spanish, the syntax is Spanish, no puedo esperar is uh, Spanish, cambiar mi mente is Spanish, except you don't change your mind, uh, cambiar mi, Mi, mi suéter, cambiar mi chaqueta, uh, cambiar mis anteojos, no? so it's perfect Spanish. Um, but you don't hacer contento in Spanish. Right? So it's the combination of words that uh, becomes very influenced by English. Uh, they're causing then all these very unusual constructions in, in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, I, I enjoyed your, your talk very much, yeah. plus the comments from, from colleagues my colleagues here. Colleagues here. Um, I'm wondering whether anybody has, has looked at, I, I assume they have, but to look at the, at, the, at the social and political situations of Spanish in different parts of the United States. In other words, there is, I mean, given all, all one has to do is, is look at the news and see all the controversy about and all the rest, to realize that, that in many parts of the country, Spanish is, is dignified to one degree or another. And obviously, if you live in a city like, like LA, where it is essentially a Spanish-speaking city, or much of New York, it's one thing. And then if you're you know, in isolated rural communities where more and more Hispanics are living now, out in the middle of Nebraska or down in North Carolina, depending on their line of work, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, the, the, the vibe that the kids pick up about their use of Spanish has to, has to influence this whole process. And I'm wondering whether anybody, obviously this, is, this goes beyond the scope of, I think it goes beyond the scope of what you're working on, but, but maybe not. It does, process. I mean, I haven't done, but I, well, I haven't done studies of that, uh, of that influence, but, but we know from reading the literature that uh, it's very important very important. I mean, when children go to school and they speak uh, Spanish at home and they get to school and they need to speak English in preschool or kindergarten or first grade, then uh, what is proposed, you know more about this than I do, is that uh, they feel that maybe there's something wrong with uh, the language they speak at home and they should uh, stop speaking it. So that has an impact. Uh, this is why, it's one of the reasons why I think that uh, universal bilingual education should exist in, um, in the United States, where everywhere, all schools uh, offer more than one language. Yeah, it would be ideal, so that children don't feel that there's something wrong, as I say, with the language that their parents speak. Yeah. Oh, I, I would just add one thing to that, Jim. Uh, it's not exactly what you're what you're asking about, but um, in situations of, uh, in cities, for example, that have large Spanish-speaking populations, a lot of the um, in the inherited attitudes of uh, prestige about national varieties of Spanish, for example, found in Latin America, are in many ways transported here to the United States. So, um, for instance, uh, a, a lot of research has been done on. Uh, populations in Houston, for example. So Houston has a, a long-established Mexican population and a less established, temporally speaking, Central American population. 
Salvadorans, Guatemalans, Hondurans, and a, an important linguistic distinction between those national groups is the Central American countries are characterized by a Spanish that is boceante in the second person singular. So they use vos instead of just tu. Um, and what some of these studies have shown is that speakers are very sensitive to the cultural capital associated with Mexican Spanish in that context. And over the course of a generation or two, boceo disappears. And there's uh, a, a, a great phrase from one of the uh, uh, interviewees uh, talking about boceo como un mask. He says sometimes he has to put away boceo if he wants to act Mexican so he can be in a better position to get a job for the day or something. This is the, the particular uh, interview that I'm thinking of. But uh, so absolutely, uh, social issues, uh, it, speakers are very sensitive to social mm -hmm circumstances, but not just with res respect to speaking Spanish in the U.S., but speaking a kind of Spanish in a local environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. and to add to that, when uh, I had the opportunity to work with immigrant families in Somerville, Massachusetts, in a bilingual program, and um, I worked directly with um, parents come visiting and then observing children in the bilingual classroom, and what I found is that um, it depends on the teacher's attitude yeah. towards that child. And sometimes it has to do not only with the dialect that they're, the environment that they're bringing, but class. Um, and so my children went to that program, and the teachers will encourage me to keep Spanish to them, to speak in Spanish to my children, but not to the Salvadorian mother, because the child was struggling. Mm -hmm. And she would, the same teacher would say, you, you have to stop speaking Spanish because you're going to confuse the child. He needs to be assimilated and learn English first. So the distinction was not about language, it was social class. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really um, a fascinating to see how that interplay between the communication, the communication between parents and teacher um, makes a huge difference mm -hmm. in terms of that possibility of kids developing bilingual development, not only at the linguistic level, but at the identity level. Teachers are crucial yeah. in all yeah. this um, ecology, as you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. Okay. Specifically returning to the role of government. <coughs> I mean, we live in an aggressively monolingual country <coughs> with, a, with a long history of uh, promoting um, monolingualism and, uh, as a badge of national identity. You know, this is part of what it means to be an American, to not to speak other languages. And we were just discussing this in one of our classes at the U. Um, how important is this, this you know, government attitude? I'm, I'm hearing these wonderful stories of subversive grandmothers, basically. <laughs> 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 I mean, and devoted. Like, <laughs> um, it's wonderful to hear. But you're all working in a, an environment which in many parts of the country is entirely antagonistic to bilingualism Right. It's, it's one of the problems. I mean, the United States is almost like a very insular country, very isolated. Uh, because you go to Europe and uh, no one would question uh, bilingualism or multilingualism. Everyone speaks the national language, though. So why couldn't it be the same in the United States? Everyone speaks English. No one refuses to learn English, by the way. I mean, that's a myth, that Hispanics refuse to learn English is a myth. The, um, I think I said it about an hour ago, that uh, in my studies in Los Angeles, I have not come across second generation uh, Hispanics who do not know English. Maybe among first generation, there are many who don't learn English. Why? Because they've arrived in this country when they are 20 years old, they have to work all day, or they never went to school in Mexico, or they went to school for just a couple of years. They, they don't uh, know how to learn English. They would like to. They all learn a little bit. Even, you know, they, they will say even people who do manual work in houses or in construction, 
will learn what is necessary. So th that's why, that's why I, you know, I'm one of the, the people who's always speaking in favor of universal bilingualism with strong English. There is no reason why English would disappear as the national language or the language with which America is identified if we also speak another language. Yeah. Any other language that you can pass on to your children. Yes. Yeah. That, that's very real. That is a very real fear from children. This is why in California, 45% uh, of Hispanics voted against bilingual education. Uh, the, uh, the ban of, on bilingual education was passed uh, in 1986 or around there, you know, just 20 years ago. 96 was it? 98? I forget now. Uh, 1998, uh, but, but so, so, you know, anything, if they abuse <laughs> bilingual education in the sense that they teach only in the other language, right, which was mainly Spanish, even though there were many other languages that were also being taught in bilingual schools, um, if it's abused and they don't introduce English from the beginning, then I agree with the parents. I mean, then English should be given priority. But uh, if they do both languages from the beginning, there is no reason why those developing with two languages would fall behind. Uh, if you go to other countries, you have to pay a lot of money in order to be able to send your children to bilingual schools. Bio, yeah, any of the subjects. The content. Yeah, the content. But th that's what I mean. I mean, you can you can teach biology in Spanish or biology in English. They so don't teach all. on how diplomatic you'd like to be from a parent. Um, yeah. I think what you can say is that the notion that the natural linguistic state of the human mind as monolingual is completely incoherent. Um, yeah, you can say that, in fact. Um, but uh, there's, there's every reason to believe uh, that the human species and the linguistic faculty of the human species is predisposed to multilingualism, not just bilingualism. In fact, three, five, maybe even six or seven languages. Um, there's very good reason to believe that the way language evolved uh, was such that there were small groups, uh, hunter-gatherer groups, uh, fission-fusion groups that were highly multilingual. Uh, so the human brain is certainly equipped. It's modern conceptions about language and society that need to be rethought. Right. And it's going to depend on the quality of the teacher. Let me tell you, the school might be a monolingual school, and you wouldn't be sure whether. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but one thing that is happening now um, in terms of the core um, framework of education, right, is that language now is taking a more predominant uh, place. And um, sometimes, you know, cognition helps, and children could have 
done the math work uh, without the language, probably. But now everything is language based, and if they don't have the English, right. it's very hard to. Yeah. To you, you mentioned in the books um, something about the testing yeah. of immigrant children through English, yeah. um, and maybe they are perfectly dominant and capable, and they can mm -hmm. uh, prove, um, you know, um, knowledge in the subject matter in Spanish, but they are tested in, in other English. language, right. and, and then they send it to special education or IEPs. Uh, so that line between content and language and assessment, yeah, as you were mentioning, it's, it's, yeah. it's fine, it's delicate. Fine line, there was yeah. Another, yeah. yeah. So so your, your remark at the beginning is really important. There's an imbalance in those who only have um, studies of grammar in one language, and then the, the second language is just colloquial at home. So there's no grammar uh, input, formal, formal grammar. And what is the consequence of this in terms of inequality at the time of being sort of competitive when you go out there and you're training to be bilingual, but you would really, then you're lagging, lagging behind in your grammar skills, syntax, and, and so on. So if you elaborate a little bit on that, and, and the need, plus for the need for formal commitment of the government, Well, ideally, of course, the, both languages would develop equally. Uh, that's unrealistic also, because just as well, you said, I mean, the human faculty for language uh, uh, predisposes us to, uh, or we, we should be able to acquire not just one, but two, three, or four or more languages. It is also the case that uh, balanced bilingualism doesn't exist. I mean, no one, or most people know one language better than the other, even if they are bilingual. Um, so balanced bilingualism or equal bilingualism in two languages or more than two uh, is a rarity or very exceptional. Um, now, as far as the role of the school in teaching grammar, they don't teach English grammar either. So yeah, they, they, go to, they go to school and grammar doesn't have, the, 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 it is not taught in school any longer. They, they learn the grammar by practicing it, by, by using the language, by reading, by being exposed to the language. Now, I'm a firm, believe, firm believer that uh, the formal teaching of grammar would help. <laughs> in, but not in elementary school, perhaps in, uh, or I don't know at what level. I mean, you, you're more of an expert on this. I, I don't know, but uh, uh, in uh, junior high school or high school, children could uh, be introduced to grammatical notions and the structure of their language and how the languages are structured. But if someone has been exposed to a language, uh, let's say English, they will learn that uh, you say, well, if I were a millionaire, I would uh, live in uh, uh, Martha's Vineyard, right? And, uh, or if uh, he were a millionaire, the subjunctive. Who uses the subjunctive in English? <laughs> you know, it's, it's no longer used. So um, if I was a millionaire, yet in school <laughs> they're, 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 they're taught. They're taught not to use uh, dangling prepositions. They're taught not to use, uh, um, or they're taught to use the subjunctive. In, in, in Spanish, we want to do the same but not at the level of elementary school. I don't think so. I think that at the level of elementary school, it should be more just exposure to the language, just uh, readings and writing, and by correcting their writing, and maybe. But then the notion of a sentence and connectors. What age should they start understanding that? You, you were telling me that in Mexico at about fifth grade, uh, they they no, started they, understanding. They, they, they introduced grammatical notions in the first year, 
but the textbooks in Mexico have been revised many times. Right. And they have tried to take out the grammar, the grammatical terminology, mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter if it's you know the, the names of the tenses or the right. Right. the grammatical structures doesn't say anything to a six-year old, right? Yeah. Um, they need to know um, mm -hmm. the the rules of the language to speak, as you were saying. Right. And sometimes in middle school, high school, certainly college, right? One of the yeah. requirement classes here is expos, where they have to write essays. But there's, there's a function, there's a structure mm -hmm. specific that they learn, um, and that's the grammar. And many times I've heard that English speakers learn grammar through foreign languages mm -hmm. classes, yeah. foreign language classes. And now grammar in foreign language classes is not a hot topic. The communicative and the <laughs> post-communicative post approach, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, grammar—it's good to know. The, for me, the issue is when you value the grammar more over other things, or you mm -hmm. stigmatize someone that doesn't know grammar but knows the language. Yeah. And so I don't go know. Go ahead. I was just going to build on this comment that I think maybe what you're talking about is they don't have the support to learn more of an academic Spanish at home when they don't have maybe the support learning to read and write in Spanish. And that makes it, I think, harder to maintain um, the home language. So that puts the responsibility then again to maybe the school to support that. And, and yeah. yeah. I, I, would, I think what you said is a very well taken point and, and also your, your comment as well. Um, the idea, I think, uh, can be brought into some kind of stark relief with the notion of a linguistic repertoire. Um, and that is that all of us, when we know, even if we're monolingual, we have, like a good musician, knows when to play the right kind of tune for a given occasion. We know what variety of our language to deploy as it relates to the social context we're in. And what you're talking about is individuals who are bilingual but who may lack a formal register. So they wouldn't be very good at getting a job, for example. And that has real social implications. Uh, at a previous meeting in this very room, uh, someone who knows a whole lot about this, Ana Roca, said that, well, for these kinds of individuals, what, sh what are great uh, sources of, of real empowerment and knowledge are courses for heritage speakers who may have home proficiency, but who may not have fully developed a linguistic repertoire that also includes the kind of variety of a language that would help them compete for a job. So I fully agree with what Carmen was saying, is that this is not necessarily something you want to be teaching little people, mm -hmm. right? But perhaps a different kind of population. Yeah, heritage language courses are now becoming more common uh, around the country. Yeah, at the very back. Yeah, yeah thank you uh, for having this discussion with us. Um, you mentioned that for parents trying to teach their kids a language, one strategy they use is to have one parent speak one language and another parent speak another language with the kid. So have you seen that this process uh, results in the child having a perception of one parent as one culture and the other parent as another culture? That's very interesting. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, it's the, the question of the compound or coordinate bilinguals. Uh, because they are in the same cultural environment, I don't think that uh, there are important cultural differences. Uh, but they may develop different uh, levels of allegiance <laughs> or associations. Uh, it, it would be interesting to study that phenomenon. I mean, what happens? Uh, I, I know that uh, there are certain things that uh, I, I consider myself a bilingual, even though I'm not balanced bilingual. Um, I'm not unbalanced, someone said to me. Don't say unbalanced, because unbalanced has connotations <laughs> of being a little crazy or something. Just unequal, perhaps. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I uh, don't have the same level of uh, two languages, but uh, we, we don't have that definition of bilingual anyway, anymore. Um, sometimes I wonder myself, I mean, 
what, what is it that uh, I associate with Spanish and what is it that I associate with English? And because I have lived in this country for so long, I cannot answer that question anymore. <laughs> yeah, but when I first came here, I remember that all my emotions or words of loving uh, were in Spanish. And now that I've been married to a gringo, as we call him, uh, then, then loving is also in English. So, so uh, you start becoming or developing convergence, I guess. Uh, so just as languages converge, then your cultures converge as well. And I was just telling my colleagues here that I've even started taking supplements, which is not typical in my country. No one takes vitamins and uh, supplements? <laughs> no. You know, we eat here. <laughs> we, <laughs> right, and now I know I don't eat. I just take vitamins and supplements. <laughs> uh, so, so culturally, I've also converged towards the uh, my husband's culture. Uh, but that, that's a very interesting question. Can yeah. I can tell a quick anecdote related to yeah. that question. Uh, my children developed this idea. Of I was the one who was speaking Spanish and their father English. But at some point, they were speaking more English than Spanish. And it was when Harry Potter was you know, ah. all over the place, and they were watching the movies and all that. So I got the DVD of Harry Potter, and I put it in Spanish, right? And I remember so well, both of my children were young, and they were sitting. And then the movie started. And then everybody was speaking Spanish. And the little one was like, he looked at the older, right? right? Because the older became yeah. his, his, right. his father and mother at the same time. And they couldn't figure out. And the older one went to the kitchen and looked for me and said, Mama, what do you do to the TV? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, what, what do you mean? And I said, look at the TV. They're speaking in Spanish. <laughs> and I said, well, you see, Harry Potter is bilingual. <laughs> and <laughs> they were so upset yeah. because that was <laughs> Harry Potter in English. That's the main. Yeah. And uh, I, I never did that again because I just, you know, turned off the TV and went to the room to play in English. So that was it. But yeah. it's interesting how they buy that. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, the, the, another anecdote. I mean, I love anecdotes. Uh, short. Uh, a story that I always told the kids. Uh, it was an, an adaptation of Beowulf, Beowulf, I call it. In Spanish, of course. And the mother then one day asked him, well, tell me the story. I mean, uh, uh, or your baby told you a story or something. Yeah, yeah, about this. And they talked about Bill Wolf. Or the, well, tell me the story. And he starts, había una vez. And the mother says, no, you, you need to tell me in English. I don't understand Spanish. I can't tell you the story in English. It's in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the, this principle is very true. Mm -hmm. Complementarity principle, they call it. I mean, this is. Spanish as experience, this contextual situation, mm -hmm. and this is English. One more question? Sure. Very good question. They, uh, they, they are very respectful of the languages. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I showed that uh, little clip at the beginning. Because if the mother talks to him, they will respond in English. If the father talks to him, he responds in Spanish. Uh, make mistakes. I mean, there are sometimes, just like me, I, mean, I was. Supposed to speak in English, I started speaking Spanish. You don't realize that you're speaking the other language. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, so they are very respectful. Now, what they they do make mistakes sometimes in that they address someone out in the street or at a restaurant in English or in Spanish. Uh, usually, you know, children are smarter than we think by the way the person looks, at least in 
Los Angeles, they know whether they can address that person in Spanish or in English. And sometimes they make a mistake because that person may be from the Philippines. I mean, it happens to me. I see their Spanish name even. And the person looks very Latin American to me or Mexican to me. And I address them in Spanish. And they look at me. Oh, oh, I'm from the Philippines. OK. Children do the same sometimes. But at home, they very quickly figure out who speaks Spanish and who speaks English. Yeah. Now, the problem is when you start mixing a lot within, in, in the house, then they might find it more difficult. But uh, it doesn't matter. Children don't get confused too much. No. Okay, and while you're going to continue the conversation out there, talking to uh, the master, Professor yeah. Lancelot Urbanan, Edgar and Farrar.